Good morning, everybody out there. Uh, I am Sarah Smith. I'm a horticulturalist here at Rogers Gardens, and thank you so much for tuning in uh, and spending your morning with me. I always love talking to you all and uh, showing you all kinds of really great things we have going on here at Rogers Gardens. And today, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, lawn replacement alternatives. So different things to think about, different ways to think about your yard, uh, a little bit of the history of lawn, which I think is really kind of interesting because that's when you sort of realize lawns are pretty outdated, <laughs> honestly. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'll answer all your questions at the end as well. Talk about the fun things we have going on here at Rogers Gardens. Uh, so you can put your questions down below and we will get to those. Absolutely. So uh, as we all know here in Southern California and uh, many other places uh, in the United States, we are now dealing with a drought. Um, with the drought comes a lot of changes in the garden and and ways to think about how we use our garden. So it's a really good time to kind of step back, look at your garden and go, okay, well, what do I use this for and how can I make it more user friendly uh, and what can I do to make it more water wise? And one of the most common things people tend to kind of look at is their lawn. Um, when we think about lawns, lawns really, the history of lawns is kind of an interesting one. So it really came about from first there was, you know, lawns planted, grasses planted uh, for animals to graze on, right? So they're nature's lawn mowers. So they were eating it down and making these really pretty areas uh, that people started realizing they were attractive. Um, and it was from the animals just eating it and keeping it mowed down essentially, right? Um, and then what really started happening Happening is they started planting lawns for really no reason, uh, no practical use necessarily, um, in uh, castles, Versailles. It was in the 16th, or sorry, yeah, the 17th and 18th century uh, when they started planting that. One reason was it made areas pop, right? So uh, they had the money to maintain them. They had the uh, people to maintain them, uh, right? So they had huge, huge crews on their gardens. So it was a status symbol. It was something to uh, make the castle more noticeable. If we plant this big, huge uh, garden that's kind of wild and crazy around a castle, you can't see my castle. So I'm gonna put a lawn here. <laughs> so that way uh, it's not just a dirt area. It's a place that's maintained. It's something uh, that's really beautiful and green and lush looking, um, but it's something that is immaculately maintained by a whole crew of gardeners. So as people started seeing that, they thought, well, what can I do to make my house look more like a castle? And I'm gonna start planting a lawn. So that's really kind of how lawns got started. Uh, the first sport ever to be played on a lawn was cricket. Um, so it is, there are uses, practical uses for lawns, but a lot of times it was really just a static a symbol. Um, and when we think about now our houses and the lawns we have in our houses, and if you drive around and you look at, you know, yards that have these huge front expansive areas that are not fenced in and no one's actually using them, uh, it's really pretty wasteful if you think about it. So what you're basically doing is putting a lot of water on an area. You're putting a lot of fertilizer on an area. You have someone come in or you do it yourself and you cut that all down. So all the stuff that you watered, all the stuff you fertilized, you cut it down you throw it away right so what's kind of the point of that if you're not using it there are uses for lawn if you have them in parks we have them uh, in cemeteries we have them for kids to play on for your dogs uh, for areas to lounge on that is a useful lawn and there's no reason to feel shame for having a useful lawn but if you have a big area that you're actually not using and you're just watering it like crazy and fertilizing it like crazy and then cutting it down and throwing it away, time to kind of rethink that. Uh, it is definitely a great uh, time to look at that and go, okay, what can I do differently? Can I make my garden bigger? Can I make uh, maybe a vegetable garden? Can I make a cutting uh, garden where I plant a bunch of beautiful dahlias and roses and things like that for cutting to bring in the house? Actually making your yard useful is really important. And you don't want to just let your lawn totally die. And then as soon as they say, okay, we don't have water restrictions, just start water it all over again and now you've got to do all this legwork to repair the damage that was done during the drought this is a really good time to take those out I would also check with your cities a lot of cities will actually give you money for removing your lawn they will help you with uh, design costs and it varies city by city so don't ask me because I don't know all of them 
Uh, but look into that because they will give you money for removing lawn and putting in garden, uh, which is really great because you can use that for a designer if it's something you don't feel like you can handle uh, yourself. They'll give you um, money for installing things like smart timers and stuff like that. So there's all kinds of great rebates and stuff. So definitely check with your cities about that uh, because that's really, really helpful. Um, and a lot of those cities have a finite amount of money for that so you want to do that sooner than later once everybody really kind of jumps on the bandwagon and realizes I want to do this that money might run out so I would definitely uh, check that ASAP so that way you can actually get on that and get some reimbursement uh, for removing some lawn um, and really thinking about that space how can I make this space usable especially those houses and you see those a lot around here where they have really big front yards where nobody's using it, nobody's enjoying it, nobody's having fun there. A really, uh, it, you think about how big of a footprint that is on your uh, whole entire property lot, it's just wasted space that you're paying for. So it's definitely great to actually go in and make it usable. Uh, you know, put out some chairs, put a really nice big shade tree, actually enjoy that front yard and make it useful for yourself. So good time to think about that. Um, I want to show you some different alternatives that we have here for planting in areas where you're like, okay, well, I can't make a big wild jungle in the front of my house because no one's going to be able to see it. And that's not necessarily what you want to do. When you're thinking about a good design for a garden, there are definitely areas of interest and definitely areas of calm. So you want your eye to travel through a good garden and have areas where your eyes rest and have areas that you actually notice that are more interesting. So it's just like floral design or anything else you always want your eye to travel through that area and have it tell kind of a story so there are times when you need large areas uh, where you need something that is going to be low and tight and tidy and green you don't want to necessarily rip out your whole entire lawn and just put a bunch of gravel in there or a bunch of DG in there uh, you're not gonna have to water but what that is going to do is it's gonna create like heat island so now what's gonna happen is you're gonna have to use a lot more energy to cool down your house so we want to stay away from that right a lot of times people think okay this is a great time to put in an artificial lawn artificial lawns astroturf uh, let's just call it what it is is really really a bad idea uh, it doesn't last very long despite what the companies might tell you that oh it's gonna last for a really long time it really starts to look pretty bad after about five years ten years at the very very most it does not get recycled so it is a huge huge footprint of uh, a lot of plastic being used, uh, a lot of energy being used, and they do not get recycled. And another thing that happens commonly with that is we're now creating another heat island. That stays really hot. It does not get cooled down. It is not something that's 100% maintenance for free. A lot of people think that it is. It does have to be washed down. Um, and what happens too is now that's creating all kinds of heat underneath in the ground and you're killing off all the good things in the ground. So now you're basically solarizing all of the ground and you're killing all of the earthworms you're killing all uh, the beneficial bacteria and the beneficial nematodes and stuff like that so really astroturf is not the way to go uh, I try to keep people as steered away from that as possible because it is really not a great option for replacing lawns um, putting in something that actually is going to cool down and take a little bit of water is good but things that are definitely going to take less water than lawn is really really important so we have a couple of really great examples here of different things to use um, I brought some of my favorites um, this one here this is uh, Ruskus this is dwarf carpet of stars this is my absolute favorite for a lawn alternatives so if you are gonna shrink down your lawn area and make it a little bit more usable do some more planting in there uh, but you still need some area uh, where you can walk across an area to cut across the calm areas for your eyes to kind of rest this is a really really great option for you so dwarf carpet of stars it does get covered in a tiny little purple flower that's super duper cute very low very tight always stays low and tight like this it never really gets any kind of height to it um, it's definitely low water full sun it can handle some shade but it is not a deep shade plant uh, and what I love so much about about this is not only is it nice and green and lush and beautiful uh, but because it's so tight when it uh, grows together it really keeps the weeds down so it suppresses the weeds um, some plants that people will tend to use as lawn replacements um, don't grow really really tight together so what happens is uh, as weeds get in there and they're very hard to remove and get out um, so I really like this one for the tightness of it and you can walk on it I know it doesn't look like something you can walk on we've actually planted some here we'll show you at the end here uh, in between some step stones and everybody in the beginning was so afraid to walk on it and I would watch everybody kind of
kind of step over it. I'm like, no, you step on it, step on it. Uh, and it actually grows really, really great and it's totally walkable. So this is Dwarf Carpet of Stars. This is my absolute favorite. I love the green lushness of it. Uh, and if you have dogs, if it's an area that you have to cut across occasionally, totally walkable. It's not something that you can play sports on uh, necessarily, but it is something that you can walk on occasionally. And if you think about how often you actually truly walk on your lawn, probably not very much for most people. So this is a really, really great uh, alternative. Requires a whole heck of a lot less water. Grows really fast. So when you buy them in squares like this, what you do is you pop them out. So it's big, one big planting, and then you break it up into pieces and you're going to plant that and it covers in very, very quickly. So again, I'm going to show you an area that we did here and we we only did it maybe about two months ago now and it's really filled in quite a lot so uh, you break it up into little pugs uh, you plant it and then allow it to come together and it grows very very fast so it depends on how patient you are how quickly uh, you want it to be totally covered or not uh, versus on how far you plant those plugs but it is something that grows very very fast the other one that's really nice and tight and I'm gonna reach down here and grab it this is Dimondia. Uh, Dimondia has become really, really popular. and People have been using this for quite some time. Um, the Dimondia is also very nice and tight. It's got this grayish color. Uh, so it is something that when you are planting a new area where you're used to having a lot of green, uh, you really have to kind of think about the color contrast on that. Uh, this is also walkable as well. And this also gets a flower on it. It gets a tiny little yellow daisy kind of flower on it. Uh, so this is really nice and walkable and very, very tightly knit together too. So so again, that weed suppression is really nice uh, because of how tight this is knit together as it starts to grow. Uh, also, low, low water. This one requires more sun than uh, the Dwarf Carpet of Stars. Um, so if you have it in shadier areas, that's when you start to see die back. And I want to show you kind of what that looks like. This one was actually shoved up underneath the table accidentally uh, that we didn't notice. So you're getting a little bit of that die back there. Uh, and that's just because it wasn't in the full sun like it wanted to be. Um, so, but that'll knit in pretty quickly. And now that I found it and we'll put it back in the full sun, it'll be really nice again. Um, but this definitely needs full sun. So you're looking at six plus hours of sunlight um, for it, but this is a really, really great alternative. This looks really pretty in like Mediterranean style houses because you do tend to have a lot of like succulents and olive trees and things like that. Uh, and if you're gonna do two different areas, you could even plant both of them in two different spots. You don't wanna necessarily knit them all together. It'll look kind of crazy and a little chaotic, but uh, this is a really great one for um, those kind of Spanish and Italian French style houses uh, because it, the gray color is really incorporates very well into like the olives and stuff like that. So this is a really beautiful one. Um, and the last one I'm going to show you today is called Buffalo grass. So Buffalo grass is a grass. This can be mowed, but this is not something as you can tell by how wild it is not something you necessarily walk on. But if you do have an area where you do currently have lawn and you look at it and go, you know what, I'm not going to walk on it a whole lot. I'm not going to really play on this too much. I don't have dogs or kids that I have to deal with this. You can keep it mowed, uh, but it tends to have a little bit more of a wild look. But where this really looks pretty is in applications where you're trying to create that kind of meadowy look. Really, really beautiful. If you can build paths through it um, to like maybe an area where you have a couple of little nice chairs set out with a little table and it's something where you want to go out and sit and drink your coffee in the morning or something really beautiful like that and you want a very kind of meadowy, beautiful look, this is a really really great one for that. Um, you can tell that it works by rhizome, so it makes these little runners. So it really does take over an area pretty quickly. And it is something that should be mowed occasionally uh, just to kind of help keep it controlled. And the more you mow it, the more thicker it will be. So it can be mowed down, but it is not something that uh, is going to be as low and tight as these options will be for you. Um, but it is something that really helps create that kind of lush kind of meadowy sort of look, which is really beautiful. I've seen this planted, uh, especially on like slopes and hillsides, um, where you want to have um, a little bit of that kind of meadow vibe going on, uh, but not something you want to have to get up and try to mow all the time. This is a really great one. So this is buffalo grass, definitely low water requirement on this too. So this, all of these, if you planted any one of these in place of your lawn, you'll be cutting your water uses by two thirds easily uh, because it doesn't really require a whole lot to get it established. Uh, and 
it doesn't require a whole lot once it is established. So in the beginning, you'll be watering a little bit more uh, just to get the roots nice and going. But then once it gets established, you can cut that water down drastically, which is really fantastic. Um, and they just look beautiful. These are really, really great different ideas. Um, so you're not creating a lot of green waste. Uh, you're not using a ton of fertilizers. None of these need that much fertilizer. Um, and you're not going to be using a ton of water. Uh, so it's a win-win-win all the way around for you, for your gardener, if you have a gardener who comes in, um, and for the environment as well. So of course we will answer any questions that we have down there. If you came in a little bit late to this or you're watching this a little bit late, you can throw your questions down below and we'll get to those as well. Uh, so if I don't actually get a chance to answer your question, uh, we'll get that down in there too. So, and then we'll show you, let's, let's show before we get started on the questions, let's show what this looks like down here. So this down here is the dwarf carpet of stars. And again, we planted this probably about two months ago, maybe maybe not even two months ago, right? It hasn't been that long. Uh, and it's really filled in a ton. Uh, and it's definitely walkable, so you can absolutely stand on it, step on it, do all that kind of stuff. Um, really, really good in this kind of application where it is in between step stones too. Uh, so it works really well instead of huge expansive areas. You can also do it in like step stones and stuff like that, adds that green lushness, but doesn't have to get watered that often. So uh, really, really great um, alternative to planting sod and grasses that uh, are just gonna be pretty wasteful. So I think it's so pretty too, especially when it flowers. So it's really, really absolutely beautiful when you get that little flower on it uh, too. So yeah, we will answer questions as well. And then uh, we'll get wrapped up and I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on in the nursery too. So do we have any questions rolling in? Yeah, so let's go for it. What would you suggest for ground cover with dry sandy soil? So the um, the dwarf carpet stars will work really well on that. When you feel this, it's very um, kind of, uh, almost feels like an ice plant. So this definitely requires pretty good drainage. Same thing with the Daimondia. So uh, both of these would work really well uh, in that application. Um, you might need to add a little bit of compost to get it started in the beginning, but again, it doesn't require a whole lot. It's not something that needs a ton of fertilizer. You might need to work on t changing the texture of your soil, depending on how sandy uh, and rocky we're talking. Um, but this is something that will do well in that. This does not do well in areas where it's really dark and really wet. That's when this will start to rot out because it actually doesn't need a lot of uh, water. So uh, you're, you're actually in a better situation than most with people who have soil that doesn't drain very well and they actually have to work on that. So both of these will work. Dwarf Carpet of Stars, the Ruscus or the Damondia down there will work really well uh, in a situation like that. Um, so yeah, you want to stay away from really water uh, heavy soils, clay soils that don't drain really well. You'll have to work a little bit on changing the texture for that. So, but both of these would be great for you. Absolutely. Are these pet friendly? Um, so here at Rogers Gardens, we do not give away any kind of poison information because of liability reasons. <laughs> you tell I say that a lot. Um, so I tell everybody, look it up. Definitely look it up. Pet friendly in the way that dogs can walk on it, pee on it, poop on it, all that kind of stuff. Yes. Uh, but for poison, uh, you know, toxicity information, that's not something I'm allowed to give away, but it is something you can definitely look up. Uh, every dog is different too. Uh, you know, you got a little tiny dog that eats something that's poisonous versus a big dog who eats, you know, something that's poisonous. They're going to react differently to that. So definitely look that up. You can always check with your vets. Uh, the ASPCA has a great website as well. So I direct a lot of people to that when they're here in the store. How often do you water dwarf carpet of stars and do you have to mow it? So you don't have to mow it because it stays very, very low. What you will have to do is edge it occasionally. So it will grow over the edges of things. It's already growing over the edges of some of our stepstones here. Uh, so edging it is something that you'll have to do, but you don't have to mow it because it'll stay very low. Um, once you get this established, depending on where you live. So if you're very coastal, I would say, especially in the cooler months, uh, once a week would be totally fine. Uh, even less than that, if we're in our kind of rainy periods. Um, during the summer months, when we're getting hotter and drier, I would say probably probably about two times a week. To get it established, however, it takes a little bit more, just like any plant. Because what you're trying to do when something gets established is you know that the roots on it are as short as the container they came in. So I'm gonna pull this one out just because it's easier, right? So the roots only go down this far. We are trying to get water past the roots so the roots break out of the little root ball that they're originally in and then search down for, 
for moisture down below. So you have to water past this area to accomplish that and a little bit more frequently because it is so shallow and it's hot and dry out, it's going to dry out a lot faster. So it does need a little bit more water in the beginning to get it established. But uh, if you watched any of our videos, you know the key to watering is low and slow, right? So we want our water uh, to go down really, really deep. We want our roots to be really, really deep. The deeper our roots are, the happier our plants are and the less they struggle with heat waves and things. So that's how you can really tell like a good established garden that has really nice deep low uh, roots versus someone who's watering too frequently and too shallow. Uh, once we hit like a really big hot day, everything really panics in that other yard because the roots are very shallow and close to the surface and they stress a lot faster. Uh, so to get this established, I would say right now, I would probably maybe water it about three times a week. Uh, that fits in with most of your water budgets anyways uh, in your cities. Uh, so uh, most places are allowing three times to two times a week and that would be totally fine to get this established. Um, and then once it's established, then you can definitely cut that and you don't need to water as frequently. So uh, definitely like twice a week, hot days, once a week. Uh, if it's rainy, you can cut it completely. It really doesn't need a lot. This one particularly more so even than the um, Daimondia, the gray one. Uh, this one is definitely a lot lower uh, water than that even. So if you're real, real coastal, I say you can probably get away every two weeks watering it um, and you'll have to look at it and watch it again when we get into times like this when we're dealing with drought you have to kind of look at your yard and look at it and think okay how bad am I willing to let it look before I have to uh, intervene and apply water to it so you're gonna have to be a lot more um, accepting when we come through a time of having droughts and stuff to allowing the yard to look not as lush as normal and that's just kind of how we have to do it but I say that applies to everything thing same thing with bugs and stuff when people come in and they have a lot of aphids on their plants and I always look at it and go you know you got to kind of think how much of a load of aphids am I willing to accept <laughs> is it gonna get uh do you need them squeaky squeaky clean and perfect no because there is uh reasons for those bugs as well they feed the ladybugs right so aphids feed the ladybugs so you don't want to have your plant totally sterile uh, but you want to look at it and go, okay, now when is it actually affecting my plant? Same thing with water. How much water can I cut back before the health of my plant uh, really becomes endangered? And when do I step in and intervene? So same thing with your watering schedule right now. And we just got to be a little more accepting to plants that look a little bit more stressed out. Uh, that's just something we got to kind of deal with. But we roll with those punches as gardeners, right? <laughs> so any other questions? What if you need a place for your dog to go to the bathroom? Do these options work like grass? They do, yeah. So these actually work really well. I find that the dwarf carpet of stars more so than that gray diamondia uh, is a lot more accepting to that. Uh, even lawns aren't super accepting to that. I do have a small um, patch of lawn in my garden uh, that has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller through the years, but I do have a dog, uh, so he needs an area to go use the restroom as well. Uh, so I have a grass that works by rhizome runners like this, and so when those areas look bad, uh, I kind of just pull that out a little bit and allow it to like fill back in. Um, with um, the dwarf carpet of stars, uh, the Ruscus, it can handle a little bit of that too. But as you can see, and I can pull a piece off like the edge here, I'm just going to actually snip that off. You can see how this works. This actually works by um, running along, right? So none of that is even actually rooted in yet, but that is covering in. So when you're looking at something that will repair quickly, you're looking for that kind of growth. Same thing with uh, this buffalo grass. It has these runners. So anything that works like that is going to repair a whole lot faster. That Daimondia doesn't. So I would say the Daimondia for pets less so than the dwarf carpet of stars and the buffalo grass. Uh, really, really good in between step stones and walking on and things like that. But for burning out pieces with like dog urine and stuff, I would stay away from that. Uh, these two will work really great as an alternative to that. Uh, however, for um, for your dogs for peeing on and stuff and walking on too. Uh, you know, you'll notice those little trails of where the dogs constantly are walking. So uh, that will repair a whole lot faster. Um, and then we always sell little flats of this. So if you have a little area that needs to be repaired, you can always just come in and buy a flat, which is really nice to do um, little repair spots um, on any areas that you need to. Uh, but this works really well for that, absolutely. 
My small backyard is half in complete sun, half in complete shade. Uh -huh. Any suggestions? So that's where you're gonna have to look at that yard and go, okay, how am I gonna divvy this up? So you're definitely going to um, have to work with the sun that you have in that area and what's gonna be happy in that area. Um, in your area in full sun, you can absolutely plant uh, the dwarf carpet of stars, but in your other shaded area, maybe consider really making that into an actual plantable area uh, and actually putting plants in there. I think this is a really, really good time for everybody to look at the lawns that we have and the square footage that it takes up and think, how can I shrink this down and make it more usable? Um, and you might wanna actually put like maybe possibly a pathway in that area of something like some DG or something that's water permeable so the water actually goes down into the ground and gets filtered through the ground. Uh, so that would probably be where you wanna look at that and go, okay, this area I'll make as like a lawn type alternative area, uh, maybe make a path through your shade spot and then build a bed on the other side of that path. Uh, so that way you can actually have some plants and stuff in there. And there's a ton of great low maintenance plants. They're not gonna be lawn alternatives because they're gonna have more height to it, right? But they're gonna be essentially the same kind of thing where you're watering it and you're doing a little bit of maintenance on it, but you're kind of letting it go. And that's actually gonna create a more obviously lush yard than a whole area of bunch of lawn. Uh, and then also help really reduce the, the electricity and stuff that you have to do for your, keeping your house cooler, um, which is really kind of a win-win-win all the way around, uh, and not create that kind of heat island sort of situation. Um, so definitely think about how can I divvy this up into more spaces. And like I said, with my lawn, when I first showed up, it was all lawn and a big tree. And now I've got all kinds of vegetable beds all over the place. I have a nice hedge that kind of protects me from uh, looking out on the street. I have a little area of some stone with some fountains uh, going there. So I have some water for the birds. It's really, really changed. Uh, my patio has expanded some and gotten a little bit bigger for more usable space for us. So my lawn has gotten littler and littler and littler and littler over time um, but I don't really need much my daughter's a lot older so she, I don't need a lawn for her we used to you know put pools out and stuff in the summertime but she's 13 she's not interested in that anymore and I have just a small dog so he doesn't need a whole big space either so uh, it's definitely gotten a lot smaller the lawn type has changed uh, to be something more water wise so uh, it's definitely time to look at that and figure out how you can make your yard more usable for sure what plants do you recommend for a berm? Uh, it's just gonna kind of depend on what your exposure and stuff is gonna be there. Um, so there's tons of different things. Also depends on what your house uh, looks like, what your style is. Uh, it's something that needs more um, information to break that kind of thing down uh, for sure because you want to make sure that whatever you are planting it's something that actually fits with the style of your house uh, is going to work well in your sun or shades type situation um, and how you irrigate there that's also going to change uh, the kind of things that you plant so um, that's why I always say designers are great I think everybody wants to do a little bit of your own but incorporating a designer to come in to work in your garden with you uh, even if they're the kind of designer that comes in and just says this is kind of the things you should do let me give you a list of plants and stuff and then that way you can uh, slowly tackle it on your own it's not something where you have to hire a really expensive designer who's gonna come in and do it all for you uh, you know sometimes we don't have the money for that sometimes you want to get your hands dirty too but actually having someone come in who has a lot of good plant knowledge to give you ideas so you're successful and then that way you have a plan going forward I always tell everybody having a plan is really important even in my own yard I do have kind of a little plan that I drew up ages ago that I always kind of revisit so I make sure that as I'm planting especially when you work someplace here where you see so many cool plants and you want to buy everything I don't want my yard to look crazy eclectic <laughs> it needs to have a little bit of a flow and rhythm and theme to it so every once in a while I revisit that plan and go okay where did I really kind of go wild and I need to kind of rein it back in a little bit uh, having a color theme having uh, something that matches your house is really important so a really really good garden really probably started with a great plan uh, that continues to get revised revised but uh, continues to kind of be the theme that you stick with I think it's very very important for sure do wild rabbits eat eat this 
So, uh, especially with the buffalo grass, yes. Um, I don't really find that we have problems with the Ruscus or the Dimondia here. We have lots of rabbits here, so um, I see them eat things that technically they aren't supposed to, <laughs> which is funny. A hungry rabbit will eat anything. Uh, but we always say, you know, they're really going for textures. And I tell a lot of people, like, look at it and think, would I want to eat this? That's a really good way to tell if a rabbit's going to eat it. Um, I do not find that they go for the Ruscus or the Dimondia. However, a hungry rabbit will eat anything. And I've seen them eat things that's really shocking. Uh, so it's kind of a trial and error with this kind of stuff. Um, the buffalo grass, I have seen them eat. But again, that's kind of like where lawns first became popular in the first place, right? It was a lot of grazing lawn areas that were just grasses for the animals to eat and they were working as natural lawnmowers themselves. So <laughs> in something like this, that might not be a bad thing because it'll help keep it nice and short and kept looking and tidy. It's just like when people buy goats to mow their lawns for them, it's the same <laughs> thought. But I do not see them eat this one or that one. Not to say that they won't, but I've never seen them eat it here and we do have a lot of rabbits uh, here. So they tend to stay away from it. Can you repeat the names of all the plants? Yeah, so the first one that I showed, I believe this was the first one I showed, this is the Dwarf Carpet of Stars. Dwarf Carpet of Stars uh, does get a tiny little purple uh, daisy type flower on it, and a lot of them, it's really beautiful um, in the summer, uh, like spring and end of summer. Um, this is, uh, the botanical on this is Ruscus, it's R-U-S. C uh, H I A Ruscus or Dwarf Carpet of Stars. Um, the next one I'm pretty sure I showed you guys was the Dimondia. This Dimondia, like I said, was one that got shoved up underneath a bench, so it was getting some shade. That's why there's some little die out. So that really shows you, though, that this definitely needs uh, full sun where the Ruscus can handle a little bit more shade. So this is Dimondia right here. This is the one that has that grayish tone to it and it gets a little yellow flower on it. Uh, very walkable as well. And this one here is a buffalo grass. So if you're dealing uh, with an area that you want to have it look a little bit more meadowy, you can also mow this as well um, and keep it tidy and tight if you want to. Uh, but this I think looks really pretty on like hillsides and kind of those meandering sort of uh, a little bit more meadowy type gardens. Uh, and this works by a runner. So this is buffalo grass and it comes in these little plugs like this and it grows pretty quickly as well. So these are all great alternatives. And you can see, obviously I'm setting these on top of each other. They can handle weight. So uh, you can absolutely walk on these. Uh, you can absolutely have foot traffic on them um, and they are really durable and very low water, which is the really great thing about them. What makes them so cool. So awesome. Um, so uh, if you have any more questions, go ahead and stick them down below. And then that way um, we'll get to them for you later. Um, but uh, make sure that you are definitely signed up for our email list because we've got Christmas coming up. We've got Halloween coming up. We have all kinds of fun things. Uh, if you're already signed up for our email list, you probably already know about Halloween. But Halloween opening is coming up soon. I am so insanely excited about it. Uh, the theme this year is really, really cool. Uh, every year I get really excited for Halloween. Halloween has become such a thing here at Rogers. Uh, opening day, there is always a line. There are people waiting outside to come in uh, before we even open the store. It is so beautiful. Uh, our team here of uh, designers and uh, merchandisers do such a beautiful, amazing job. They make all kinds of original one-of-kind pieces, uh, which is really fantastic. They build that room. It is completely transformed. You wouldn't even believe it's the same room. And every year, uh, they never, ever cease to amaze me with uh, uh, all the creative beautiful things uh, that they come up with uh, and Christmas is coming up believe it or not we're already starting to get Christmas merchandise here at the store that we're getting ready to put out for you guys it's unbelievable that this year has gone by so fast uh, but Christmas will be coming up soon and at one point we have Halloween and Christmas open at the same time uh, which is really fun and if you know our theme it's even better um, so definitely make sure that you're signed up for that so you know what's going on and that you're following our Instagram and Facebook pages that's where you're seeing all these videos anyways uh, so we always make sure that we post them later so that way you can go back and review them. You can send them to a friend. Uh, you can tag your friends down below and let them know, hey, you know, I know you've been thinking about redoing your lawn. There's all kinds of great information in this video about that. Um, and our YouTube page. Our YouTube page is amazing. There is 
so much information there. You can find anything that you could possibly want to know about. We have a video about it in our YouTube page, promise. It's really amazing. So there's all kinds of great stuff there as well. So make sure you go uh, and go subscribe to that because a lot of really great stuff is going to be shown there that you're not going to see on Facebook or on Instagram. Uh, so you can see all the great things that we have going on here at Rogers Gardens. It is such a fun time of year. We still have our, summing bir our hummingbird summer uh, going on right now. So we have all kinds of great hummingbird activity because we have all the hummingbird plants all in one area. Uh, we still have a really great assortment of feeders as well uh, and a really fantastic nectar for them. Um, and we're still doing our milkweed exchange program. So uh, if you haven't checked that out yet, you should definitely look into it. If you've got milkweed at home and it has a red or an orange or a yellow flower, you got the wrong kind guarantee it. Uh, and if you bring that in, we will give you a milkweed, a California native milkweed uh, in exchange for that. So if you haven't seen the news yet, or you don't know that information, or you know that your neighbors have uh, the wrong one, make sure you let them know that if they dig it out, we will actually give them a free one. Uh, and then we have it for sale here as well. We have them in one gallons and in five gallons. Um, so that way you can feed the butterflies the right thing because they are now officially on the endangered species list, which means they're two steps away from being extinct, which is really kind of a scary thought. So uh, let's do the right thing for uh, all those beautiful butterflies, uh, our state butterfly, the monarch, which is so gorgeous. And there's so much activity here too. So if you want to come in and see hummingbirds and uh, all the butterflies doing their things naturally, we've got tons of them. It's so amazing. It's a great time in the garden right now because they're super active. So thank you so much for tuning in. I always appreciate it. Uh, again, leave your questions down below, sign up for that email list and be well and be safe and happy gardening, everybody.